this is a formal welcome to the MedStar Institute for Innovation's fifth annual Innovations Forum. The topic, uh, as you know, is memory. And uh, for those of you who've attended our previous forums, a warm welcome back. And those of you who, for whom this is the first forum, uh, a well, warm welcome forward. You can see up or there on the left, we have the agenda of all five forums there for you to see. It's trying to create a little memory ourselves. Um, this is, this is predominantly, mostly MedStar associates here, but there are also people from outside of MedStar and with whom we worked closely in the past, and I hope that you too are gonna feel completely at home. Uh, we had about 360 or so registrants. Um, we've lost a couple because of the, uh, a lot of meetings going on today about Ebola, but this may be the biggest MedStar wide gathering of associates uh, in our history. So you here are making history. And I want to extend, uh, Ed, can I have the clicker? Or did you? Uh... I'm here for you, Dr. Smith. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He's always here for me. Um, I want to extend a, uh, a gracious thank you. Can we get the next slide? To um, uh, our friends and colleagues at the Cerner Corporation who've made a generous contribution to help fund this forum. So what's today about? It's a day to move into a place that's uh, different from the one you occupy on a regular basis. It's a day to think differently, a day to escape the tyranny of the daily, uh, let your mind move to new places. You know, I'm not quite getting this right. So let's invoke another innovation forum tradition and bring in one of the greatest storytellers of all time and see if he can explain it better than I just did. traveling to another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. So those of you know, that was Rod Serling. And if you've never seen the Twilight Zone television series, you're, you're in for a real treat. It's timeless. So we've covered many topics at our previous innovation forums safety, design thinking, information visualization, creativity, complex systems, storytelling, influence. Why memory this time? Well, a good, a good topic for innovation forums have to meet two criteria. They have to be fun and engaging and bring us to a new place. They have to have relevance to the MedStar vision, which is to be the trusted leader, caring for people, and advancing health. You know, I could say I've forgotten how exactly we stumbled across memory as a topic, um, but I promised our team I'd refrain from any lame memory jokes, so we'll pass that one on. So the short answer to why memory is that memory is the biggest and most all-encompassing topic of them all. The stuff of memory is everywhere, informs everything, and defines everyone. It really pervades every aspect of who we are and what we do. And here is a, a little, little um, dive a little deeper into the chronology of how we chose it. Because first of all, it is directly connected, the topic of memory is directly connected to the MedStar vision. Uh, specifically the intersection of memory and clinical care. I'm gonna give you four ways. The first reason may actually not uh, be top of mind, but our doctors and our nurses rely on their memory to access all that learning and knowledge that they've garnered in order to be there for our patients. And uh, it's not just cognitive memory, but it's muscle memory from the simplest task like putting on a blood pressure cuff, the most complex and delicate maneuvers performed by a surgeon in the OR. Secondly, you know, I, when I went to medical school, we started out the principle, primum non no carry, above all else, do no harm. And yet we know that harm does occur from the incorrect things we do or the correct things that we forget to do. Um, and I would submit to you that one of the reasons for many of the preventable serious safety events is false reliance on the infallibility of our memory. In fact, next slide, that's really what checklists are designed to counteract. And here's a surgical checklist from the MedStar Franklin, from MedStar Franklin Square. Uh, each one of those, little, those uh, items is ticked off and goes blank or goes light uh, to make sure that we are in fact don't forget to cover every single important aspect before an operation. 
during an operation and after the operation. Thirdly, uh, third reason, memory in particular, its loss is a major medical problem that afflicts millions of our older pa uh, patients or old, the older population. And we're gonna have two sessions devoted to Alzheimer's disease uh, later in the afternoon. The fourth intersection of clinical care and memory is traumatic events. Those that occur, say, during the combat of war uh, or from childhood sexual, physical, and emotional abuse. Uh, these events can engrave memories that result in long-term PTSD and profound lifelong effects. Um, but the more I actually thought about memory, the more I realized, but wait, there's more. In fact, if you take the uh, biopsychosocial model of health, which is sort of the generally accept, one of the generally accepted models. It's clear that memory plays a role in each of those three domains. We touched on the biological already, briefly on the psychologic, and um, you know, one's place in the social fabric is built into a complex recursive set of interlocking memories that actually constitute culture. Bob Rosen, who is uh, the author of Grounded, which is a sort of New York Times bestseller book, talks about what we do being a function of who we are, and that's six dimensions of health, physical, emotional, relational, intellectual, vocational, spiritual. Memory in multiple forms and in multiple ways touches and determines the level of health in each of these dimensions. The truth of it is that memory is like innovation. It's actually everywhere if you look for it. Our sense of self, of community, of organizations, of history, of nations, of culture, of religion depend on it. It's sort of the ether that pervades everything. Now, if art is the window into our soul, then memory is its mother, quite literally, in fact. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of the, the nine Greek muses, epic poetry, history, music, uh, tragedy. Well, it turns out, what you may not know, is that the mother of all these muses was this person, Nasume, the goddess of remembrance. And the father, actually, was none other than the scoundrel Zeus. Um, sometimes the art we create is about memory itself. This is Marcel Proust, next slide please, who wrote uh, La Recherche de Tom Perdu, Remembrance of Things Past, In Search of Lost Time, and he's known for his description of what Ed talked about, um, how a, a sensory event, in his case eating Madeleine, a small a French uh, sponge cake, and drinking tea, how the taste and smell evoked incredible memories of childhood. We, it's called involuntary memory, where cues encountered in everyday life evoke recollections of the past without conscious effort. And here is the painting you saw as you walked in. This is Salvador Dali's remembrance, uh, persistence of memory. And those of you who are movie fans, oh, poetry, let's do poetry first. Um, uh, we actually have a bookmark with Billy Collins' wonderful, wonderful poem about memory on it. It is a poem about, or about forgetfulness, the opposite, here's a snippet of it. Um, and uh, I want to thank Ann Nichols of uh, uh, our Public Affairs Department for suggesting it. Christopher Nolan, uh, he of The Dark Knight and uh, Intrepid, did Memento. And Memento is a terrific movie if you haven't seen it. It's about someone who has lost the ability to form new memories. Um, but of course, every biography, every autobiography, every history, every piece of art ever created depends whether it's doesn't have to be about memory, but it depends on the vehicle of memory. Storytelling is memory passed down to an oral tradition. Um, effective advertising, you know, strives to create memes, memorable phrases, ideas that stick. Uh, here's one, many of us have it, that came out of actually World War II, keep calm and carry on. And here is probably the one that is uh, my favorite, it's lasted for, uh, for decades, diamonds are forever, it's brilliant. They associate a hard, inert substance with the most precious of human emotion, and they bring them together. Um, uh, so, you know, we also have lapses, uh, the forgotten birthday, the missed meeting, the promise forgotten, sometimes serious, sometimes not. I typically do not like cartoons in my present, in presentations, but I couldn't resist this one uh, with, <laughs> with that today. So sometimes I feel that way. So we, we strive to keep the memory of past events front and center in our conscious mind, events that, may, that we, may make us want to retaliate, may make us want to honor, um, 
or keep in our consciousness a loved one who's no longer there. And I'll just go through this. Remember the Maine, remember the Alamo. Um, uh, this is Remembrance Day, World War I, of, of uh, people, of combat veterans who died. Um, this is Yad Vashem, the uh, Holocaust Memorial um, uh, in Israel. Uh, the yellow ribbons remembering uh, people who were lost or gone, um, missing, or uh, and uh, Vietnam Memorial, which is an incredibly moving memorial. So memorials are designed to m keep memories current. Uh, Iwo Jima, and we've got, of course, the Lincoln Memorial, and it's all uh, tomb in cemeteries, it's all in loving memory. Most of you, I'm sure, um, know the quote by George Santayana, those who do not, rem do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. But um, apropos of the fallibility of mem memory, I must say the next quote by Santayana is the one I actually like even better. Um, it's about the fallibility of constructed memory, and it is, history is a pack of lies about events that never happened, told by people who weren't there. <laughs> so um, actually, so I, I was trying to think, you know, why memory? Well, for, well, actually, memory is very important to me personally. Uh, if I could have the next slide. That's me uh, as a two and a half year old, and that's my mother and my father. Uh, my father died shortly thereafter uh, when I was three years old. And for years, I, I kept two vivid memories of him. That's really all I had left. The first was when we were down in Florida where he was recuperating from his illness. In those days, you went down to Florida or Arizona for that. I remember an alligator pit and a man with a stick having an encounter with that alligator. Uh, the second memory was a memory I have of uh, being in my apartment, in our apartment in New York City where I grew up. Um, and I had a memory of my father lifting me up over his head so that I could, uh, I could touch the ceiling. Um, uh, needless to say, that these were incredibly powerful memories to me, especially the latter. But gradually over the years, these fresh, vivid memories, their, well, their vividness and their immediacy faded, or more exactly, and I think this is, they turned into memories of memories. Um, and I lost something, and because I couldn't tell if I was actually, what I was remembering was just the memory of the event or, or the actual event I itself. Now, um, for, for most of us, childhood memories are extremely vivid, and I look at my life and I see, the, I would say the first 18 years of uh, my life are much richer in terms of memory than the next, even the next 50 have been. Uh, so uh, every sense we have is involved in memory. Ed, Ed I'm gonna try to end this part on an up note here. Uh, Ed um, talked about the power of music, and uh, those of you who know me know that I am a great fan and fiend for old time rock and roll. My wife tells me it's because I'm just stuck in the past, uh, but I have begged to differ because I think it's, um, I actually think it's because the music of my generation was, uh, uh, was uh, the best around. And it's also because it's when our brain wiring was such that everything stuck more. So uh, I have a little, uh, little musical. Next uh, slide, please. That's, uh, that's memory, and, and I'm gonna just close with this section. Um, uh, me memory's really everywhere. It's the fabric, the warp, and the weft on which uh, life is played out. Um, back in the late 19 1800s, there were two scientists, Michelson and Morley, who uh, did an incredible experiment that debunked the notion of there being an ether wind through which light travels. And the absence of the ether wind was actually one of the things that led Albert Einstein to formulate his special theory of relativity. Well, I have news from Michelson and Morley, and even Einstein, although I suspect he would probably wholeheartedly agree with what I'm gonna say, since he was such a humanist at heart, that there is an ether wind after all, 
an ether wind that pervades everything. It's the ether wind uh, of memory on which time travels. So that's, that's the close of this sort of madcap tour on my own personal take on memory.